Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Bonniewell. If you're a guest with us today, I am the director of Children's Ministries, and I am so grateful to be able to share with you this morning in our last week of our sermon series, My Life Verse. Um, the last two weeks, we've had Pastor Craig as well as Ashley Crawford share about their life verse and a little bit about it, and I'm going to do so today as well. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that some of you guys have been able to use some of the tools we've given you via social media and the web to really dig into scripture and and to find your life first, because a life first is something that you can use to lean upon in good times and bad. It's something that you'll hold close to your heart and draw upon when you need it. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've never been a super big fan of life verses, just because as I've grown and gone through different stages in life, I've thought, well, I can't just have one life verse, because different scripture speaks to me differently in different times of my life. And you guys may feel the same way, and that's okay. A life first doesn't have to be something that is rigid and stays with you your entire life. It can change over time with the different seasons. Now, as I think about scripture, I think about how, as I've grown, how scripture has changed for me. As a kid, growing up in the South in the Bible Belt, scripture was rigid. It was legalistic. It was something often thrown at me as rules to live by, and you better walk that straight line or else, you know, basically hellfire and damnation. And then as a teenager, scripture became confusing. It was full of contradictions, and I had all these questions. But instead of diving into the questions and finding out more, I pulled away just like a lot of teens do. I pulled away because how, if some, how can something that contradicts itself actually be real? Now, as an adult, I still have questions, lots of them. But it's those questions that I have that I find drives me to Scripture. It drives me into the Word, wanting to find more, wanting to soak up every bit that I can. It's those questions that helped me open not only my mind, but my heart to what God is leading me to. I've been reading this book recently called Inspired, and it's all about scripture. And it, it breaks it down so that we can understand the rhyme and reason for some of it, why there's contradictions. And it takes the stories, I don't really like calling them stories, but the popular stories of the Bible, and it makes monologues out of them. So it's really cool to read. And as I was reading this, um, I came across this quote I wanted to share with you guys. The truth is, you can bend scripture to say just about anything you want it to say. You can bend it until it breaks. For those who count the Bible as sacred, interpretation is not a matter of whether to pick and choose, but how to pick and choose. We're all selective. We all wrestle with how to interpret and apply the Bible to our lives. We all go to the text looking for something, and we all have a tendency to find it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we reading with the prejudice of love, with Christ as our model, or are we reading with the prejudices of judgment and power, self-interest and greed? Are we seeking to enslave or liberate, burden or set free? You see, I can take scripture and honestly make it work for me however I want. I can use it to back up my thoughts, my beliefs, my ideas, but to do so is self-serving. And honestly, it's why the questions come. Now, today I'm going to share with you my life verse. Um, it's actually one that hasn't been with me very long. Um, it's something I came across about 10 months ago. Um, it's a verse that was just repeated over and over, and it is from Proverbs 16:9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. On this table up here, um, I have my favorite pair of shoes. Just basic black chucks. If you're not familiar with the terminology, Converse All Stars. If you look at these shoes, you can tell they're well worn. They've got paint stains on them, they've got holes in them, and if you were to smell them, just don't, okay? Just trust me on that, I feel bad for the band. These shoes are actually 10 years old. I've had them longer than I've had my youngest son. These shoes have walked with me through trials and tribulations. These are the shoes I wore the last time I walked out of my home in Houston. 
These were the sho uh, shoes I wore when I heard Felix's heartbeat for the first time. The shoes I often wore when I felt alone and isolated living in Beaumont, Texas. And they're the shoes I wore when I experienced my first Omaha snow and subsequently ran in the house and said I was never going to leave it again. Now that scene would play out many, many, many times, including recently. And if you look at these shoes, it's apparent I need new ones. I mean, they're pretty nasty. But they're tattered and they're torn. The laces are falling apart. And my disdain for wearing socks of any sort causes much of the fragrance that comes out of them. But I just, I don't want to get new ones. Why, you ask? Well, other than the fact that I'm cheap and I don't want to pay full price for a brand new pair of chucks, I've got several reasons. What if they hurt my feet? These shoes have been with me a long time. They're molded to my feet and they feel perfect. What if the new ones never feel like that? What if the new ones are too tight? What if they're uncomfortable? What if the soles don't wear just right so when I walk, I can feel my feet? And so when it comes to getting a new pair of chucks, I'm at a stationary point, at a standstill. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think many of us are at there when it comes to our hope and dreams. We're at a stationary point. We allow ourselves to come to a standstill and make excuses about why we can't do things that are on our heart, those things that God put there. We let the fear of the unknown make us stationary. What if? What if it doesn't work out? What if I fail? What if, what if, what if? And then we start to question if God even hears us. Does he even care about what this is on our heart? But here's the deal. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. That thing that's on your heart that you keep hearing over and over and over again, he put it there. You see, God's love is never stationary, and he doesn't want us to be stationary either. He's not ignoring your hopes, and he's not ignoring your dreams, because he's the one who put it there. He's the one who made you to love what it is you love. He's the one who made you to go after what it is that's on your heart. So don't give up on it. Don't quit the hustle. But do this. Stop trying to do it on your own. A wise man that I'm going to tell you about here in a little while said this to a group of people I was with recently. He asked us, what's your dream? And then he told us this. A dream is just sleep unless you do something about it. But how can you do something about it you see, we make these plans. We make plans of what we're going to do. But we forget that God is who put that on our heart and that he has a path set for us. And so we hustle and we strive to do these things and we get frustrated when all we have to do is turn ourselves to the path he put in front of us. I want to look at um, the prophet Isaiah for a minute. It's in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah that we find Isaiah finally accepting his call, what it is God has put on his heart. It was the year the king died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe, robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voice just shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, 
It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to, the, to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. You see, Isaiah 6 describes how the prophet Isaiah, through a vision through the Lord, begins his ministry. In the vision, the Lord asks, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah volunteers for service. He says, here I am, send me. The Lord had a message that he wanted to send to the nation of Judah. And he expressed his desire for this messenger. And his, Isaiah's exclamation of, here I am, send me, marked the very beginning of his ministry. And the priest became a prophet. But if you noticed in the scripture, he didn't do it immediately. He has this vision, this vision grand vision and one of the first things out of his lips before he says here I am send me is to describe his unworthiness he starts basically making excuses you know woe is me I've got unclean lips I can't do what it is God's calling me to do God's calling him to be a messenger of God and what Isaiah is saying but I have unclean lips like that's where his sin comes from is his mouth like my kids often call me out for things that I say, especially when I drive. Um, and often my response is, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. You know, that's kind of what Isaiah is doing. He's like, look, the stuff like from my lips comes, and this is where my sin comes from. And if you want me to be a messenger, God, like this is what you put on my heart. But how can I do it when the very place where your messages are going to come from is where my sin comes from? Standing in the Lord's presence, Isaiah is made painfully aware of his sin, and he's broken about it. And we've seen that before. When both Job and Peter were confronted with the presence of the Lord, they felt their brokenness too. And here in this moment, God was preparing Isaiah for both his cleansing and his commission. And I see, I think Isaiah, Isaiah wasn't just confessing his sins because he wanted to. It was his way of making excuses, his way of saying, look, God, I know you want me to do something, but there's a million reasons why I can't do it. But just like us, God had this plan for Isaiah. He had the steps already planned out. He just had to agree to follow the path laid out before him. And so when Isaiah confesses his sins and says his lips are unclean, God has an answer for that. If you notice, they put the coal to his lips, the very place where his sin came from. And God was a step ahead of him. He was a step ahead of Isaiah, and he always is. As he's cleared of his sin, that coal is placed on his lips, and God makes it a point to touch and say, look, it's okay. I forgive you. And it's after this that Isaiah finally says, okay, here I am, send me. Prior to that, he saw himself as an unworthy messenger. But once he's forgiven, he immediately desires to serve the Lord. He immediately desires to follow that path that God has put before him. To not just follow his steps, but follow God's steps for him. You know, a lot of us are just like Isaiah. We make those excuses. We wonder why we can't do things, why we can't go, why we can't follow the path, the step that God puts in front of us. But here's the deal. God puts things on our hearts for a reason. And he doesn't just put those ideas in our heads and on our hearts to abandon us. 
He asks us about us. He reminds us of those things time and time again. He says, you know that thing I put on your heart? What is it? Cool. Now how about this? How about you and I go do that thing together? Most recently, um, my dirty shoes and I traveled back home to Houston. I got to go with 82 of my closest friends down to the hot, sticky city of Houston. And when I first found out the youth, the high school youth, were going on this trip, it was immediately on my heart that I wanted to go. This was my home. You know, of course I wanted to go. And then Wolf, my 16-year-old, asked me to go. And let me tell you something, parents. When your teenager asks you to do something, do it. Because chances are it might not happen again. But as much as I wanted to jump at it and just go, I started making the excuses. I let my plans get in the way of what God had planned for me, that path. I started asking questions and making excuses. You know, I didn't know when camp was. What if camp falls when the trip goes? And, you know, it's in July. That's right after VBS. I have a ton of work to do. I've got to get prepared for the fall. So I just don't see where I can be gone for a week. And it's expensive. You know, I would be paying for Wolf to go already. And, you know, I'm a single mom. I'm on a budget. I didn't know where the money was going to come from. And so instead of yelling out that undeniable yes that I wanted to give my son, that I wanted to give Chad, I gave him a solid maybe. But then things started to happen. Found out camp was going to be the second week of June. Check. That's marked off the list. I was able to hire an intern this summer, and so he was able to take on some of my work, and so I was able to work ahead. Check. Things were starting to fall into place. And then Chad comes to me. Hey, if you want to go, it's handled. Somebody donated the money so that you could go. So at that point, all I had to do was say yes. So what do you think I did? Maybe. truth is, I was scared. You know, I've been on mission trips before. I've been on UM Army before, what the kids were doing. But I was scared. There was something in me that just wasn't sure that I could handle a week with a bunch of teenagers. And I have one, and that's hard enough. But I finally decided, you know what? God's put this on my heart for a reason. He's made all these things happen. And if this is what he wants me to do, then here I am. Send me. So last Saturday at 4.45 a.m., I joined a bunch of tired teenagers and adults, hopped in seven vans, and headed to Houston, Texas. The trip was great. There were some hiccups along the way starting out with our first night there. There was a little disorganization. And let me give you guys a little tip. If you want to be the most popular person with a group of teenage girls, be the one to take their cell phones away. Pretty sure at that moment, like, I turned into an ogre with horns and fire coming out of my head saying, you could not have your phone, ha, 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 ha. It was bad. But despite the hiccups, um, it was an amazing week. I was assigned to the group Blue F. It was combined of six kids from the water's edge and three kids from um, Sugar Land, Texas. And we were placed in the third ward of Houston. If you guys know anything about the third ward of Houston, you know it's a beautiful place. Not. It is the roughest neighborhood in Houston a place where crime is a way of life, a place where police cars and gunshots are a daily occurrence. But these kids, they weren't deterred. 
You see, each one of these kids was following the path God had set. Each one of these kids said, here I am, send me. Yeah, they made plans. They made plans to go on this mission trip, but it was God's steps that they were following. And just as a side note, you really know how rough a place is when you have to have a safe word before you leave base camp. Ours was pigeon. I don't know why, but it just seemed like a good thing. It was hot, and the work was hard, but the kids never complained. In fact, when they ran out of things to do, they asked for more to do. They went to each person in our group, making sure they had taken water breaks, making sure to get out in the shade. Our hottest day there, it was 108 degrees with 65% humidity. And if you've ever um, dealt with Houston humidity, you know it takes your breath away. You walk out in the morning and you're already sweaty. And these kids were dealing with this with a smile on their face. Despite this fact that removing siding meant having cockroaches, spiders, lizards, and frogs come jumping out at you, they worked with a smile on their face. They put their hearts into their work for our residents, Mr. and Mrs. Allen. A quiet couple who seemed to pay a little attention to the nine kids and two adults who took over their yard each morning. Day by day, we'd arrive, get started, and barely get a hello. And despite hearing stories from the other kids about how their residents came out each day to greet them and work alongside them, our kids kept working. If it bothered them, that they were being ignored, they never let it on. Then Thursday night happened. Thursday night was client night, the night when we invite our residents to come share a meal with us and join us for worship. When we asked our residents if they would join us, we got a solid maybe. The kids weren't deterred. They went to our shower house, the home where... Um, these people graciously opened their home to a bunch of stinky, sweaty teenagers and adults and allowed us to use their showers. Mark and his wife, Susan, said, sure, we'll be there. But you could still see a little sadness in our kids. Thursday night rolls along. We get back quickly, get showered, get set up, get into dinner, and look around, and Mr. and Mrs. Allen aren't there. Our shower house people are there, and we look around, and we're the only table whose residents aren't there. And you could tell the kids were a little disappointed. Well, about 15 minutes in, Mac, the director of the camp, comes in, and beside her are Mr. and Mrs. Allen with smiles on their faces. Our kids started to cry. They were just overjoyed they were there. That night, we got to hear their story finally. We got to hear about how both of their health just wouldn't allow them to come outside. How her doctor's appointment on Monday wiped her out for days because chemo will do that to a person. How he was a carpenter by trade. And he wanted to be out there with the kids, but his mind was failing him. And he just couldn't remember how to do the things he once did. And why they told us their story, they also shared about how they had been watching the kids all week. How that silly girl jumped the fence when she saw the frog. How they giggled watching the little ones stand up on their tippy toes to reach the high spot instead of grabbing the ladder how they listened to the kids sing along with the worship music they, pray, they played, and how it brought a tear to their eye to hear teenagers worshiping openly. When it came to move to the sanctuary, the kids gathered around them, creating a pre protective barrier around them in the crowd. And I wanted to share a photo. It's right behind me. If you look at these tired faces, if you look into their eyes, you can see the joy. Joy that came from these two people in the center. 
joy that came because these kids said, here I am, send me. Despite the conditions, they never lost sight of the path God set before them. Yeah, they're the ones who made the plans to go on this trip. They packed their belongings. They raised money. They willingly gave up their cell phones. But it was God who paved the path for them. It was God who determined the steps. It's God who led them to that moment right there. They did it willingly, but they didn't do it on their own. They did it with God. And there's one more person I want to introduce you to. His name is David. I think I have a picture of him. This is David. David is referred to his friends by, as King David. As he puts it, a man after God's heart. He's the one who said to us, a dream is just sleep unless you do something about it. This guy, King David, he spoke to us during resident night. He's 33, and he's had a rough life. He's done things most of us can't even imagine. One of his stories included pulling a bullet out of his own ankle and going on about his business. On the fly, David felt God calling to him to speak to these kids. And so in front of 150 strangers, he gave a speech that made the, arm, the hair on my arm stand up, the ones that weren't singed off from the heat earlier in the day. He told the kids, it's not too late to ever follow that path that God set before you. Despite his setbacks in life, most of them were self-induced. At 33 years old, David was finally following those steps God placed before him. He was chasing the dream that God had placed on his heart as a young man. That dream to work with youth and help them chase their dreams with God. I got the chance to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one with David Friday afternoon. Um, I got to go out to the job site before I headed off for my flight. And I actually jokingly invited him to come preach for me today. And he said yes, which created a very awkward moment. Um, but David's just like this amazing man. And he told me, look, you know what? All my life, I knew what God wanted me to do. All my life, I knew that he wanted me to work with kids. But I ran from it. Instead of saying, here I am, send me, I said, here I am, I'm going to do what I want. And that led him down a path of destruction. But one night, David said, okay, God, this isn't how it's supposed to be. So here I am. Send me. What struck me the most about David, besides his openness, was his love of the Lord. He grew up without a mom and dad. His uncle raised him, and it was actually his uncle's house that was being repaired. And when he spoke of his uncle, his eyes lit up. And he had this big, cheesy grin on his face, much like the one right there. This man just radiates joy. And it's a joy that's found when you start following that path God has put in front of you. David knew that God never gave up on him. No matter what those excuses were, the steps were placed in front of him. All David had to do was look and listen. When you're around him, 
you just sense the peace, a peace that only comes when you say, here I am, send me. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. You see, God is guiding us away from ourselves. He's not trying to make us something we're not. He's leading us to make us what he made us to be. He's doing what a father does. He invites us on this grand adventure. And it's not one with a map, not one with a strict schedule. There's no expiration date and the invitation is always open when we accept that invitation once again he asks us what is it that I've put on your heart child what is it that captures your attention what is it you feel led to do okay let's do that together I'll lead you follow Just follow, follow, child. That's all you have to do. We'll do this together. I'm going to close with this picture of my shoes. These are the same shoes that are here. Um, Those are my shoes heading down the highway in Houston. These shoes have traveled many, many miles. And those miles were traveled with trust. Trust in the path that he has set before me. And I know as I walk these steps, there's going to be laughter, there's going to be tears. There'll be disappointment and there'll be heartbreak. And there'll be days like today when I'm a little bit tired and I'm a little bit weary. But trusting God and having faith, it means continuing to follow those steps he puts in front of me. Even if it's just by taking baby steps on worn-out souls. Will you pray with me?